Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm honored to be able to present today on behalf of CyberSight, an overview of pediatric emergencies and eye trauma. I received so many wonderful questions from around the world, which I try to incorporate in this presentation. So we have a lot of topics to cover today. We're going to move quickly um, and try to answer any questions in the remaining time that we have left. So we'll start off with a poll question. Um, just trying to get an idea of how many pediatric patients that you currently manage in your own practice. Are you primarily a pediatric ophthalmologist or see a lot of kids? Do you see some kids, mostly adults, or are you just really here to gain some extra knowledge? We'll give you guys a few seconds to answer. All right, so um, great. It looks like we have a spattering of, of really everything and um, we do have uh, a lot of people that take care of kids, so that's wonderful. So. Looking at uh, my last patient, uh, next slide, of, the pres of my clinic yesterday, <clears throat> um, this actually walked into my clinic, an eight-year-old female. Her sibling had threw a pencil in her eye one week ago, and she presented with this. So if you take a look at this anterior segment, you'll uh, definitely be concerned about the corneal appearance. Um, and if you take a look at this anterior segment OCT, you can see that she had a full thickness corneal laceration, um, which went through the anterior and posterior cornea. However, she was Seidel negative. If you take a look at the epithelium at the top of the image, it has completely epithelialized on Seidel testing. However, if you take a look further into the eye, she also has a rupture of the anterior capsule. She has lens material coming out and a traumatic cataract that is forming. So we'll talk a little bit moving forward about how I plan to treat this patient. When we think about uh, pediatric trauma, we always want to look at the epidemiology. So for these patients, this is a leading cause of non-congenital unilateral or bilateral blindness in kids. It does account for about 10% of ER visits most commonly in the toddler age, a little bit older, three to seven, and definitely has a preference for male patients. There are about 55 million eye injuries worldwide, and, a and about a quarter of these, 19 million, will have severe visual impairment or blindness. Most times it is unilateral, but it can be bilateral. But the mechanisms of injury are variable and can be found in normal circumstances, like our eight-year-old who is playing with her sibling and presumably doing some type of homework. Um, most eye injuries can be prevented by simple protective measures and parental counseling, which we will go over towards the end of this presentation. Now, eye trauma in children does differ from adults. As we see here and all of us know, children are not small adults. It is often difficult to determine how the trauma occurred. We don't have a full history. Patients are not aware of the reduction in vision. The patient that I saw yesterday in my clinic was telling her mom that initially her vision was down, but now it was back to normal. So we do need to be uh, at a very high suspicion for these patients. There is this diagnostic delay if we do wait, um, and that will increase the risk of endophthalmitis in these patients. And examination of children is very difficult compared to adults. So when we look at pediatric ocular trauma, these are the subsets of headings that we will be going over today. We'll talk about open globe injury. We will talk about closed globe injury. We'll talk about adnexal, so eyelid and cannular lacerations, chemical injuries, as well as um, the last topic is the sequelae of trauma or um, parental counseling. When we look at pediatric open globe injuries, what we like to talk about is two different types. So there's lacerated injuries and ruptured injuries. Lacerated injuries is when there's a perforating injury and there's an entry wound only. This can lead to an intraocular form body. A penetrating injury goes through and through, exit and entry wound. Now a ruptured injury is more of a blunt force trauma and it does occur to the weakest part of the eye. But those are the thinnest points of the sclera behind the rectus muscle insertions, the limbus, the insertion of the optic um, nerve to the globe and locations of prior eye muscle surgery. So if you look at these photos here, you can see um, these are two photos of ruptured open globe injuries. One show the top photo shows uh, a rupture at the limbus, which is one of the, the thinnest portions of the eye. And the second could presumably be where the superior rectus was or prior surgery if the patient had a trabeculectomy um, or any type of glaucoma surgery. So poll question number two, we just discussed this, let's see what we learned. What are among the most common locations of open globe rupture? Now this photo over on the corner, you can see is actually um, a lacerating injury through the cornea that had iris prolapse. 
through the cornea and uh, this would be uh, a uveal type of prolapse. Um, so actually B is not correct. It's actually posterior to the rectus muscle insertion. So anterior to the rectus muscle, this, the sclera is actually thick, whereas posterior to the rectus muscle, the sclera is thinner. So B would not be correct. Um, so the answers A and C are correct. The limbus, locations of prior eye muscle surgery, posterior to the rectus muscle is insertions, locations of prior eye muscle surgery, and then also where the optic nerve enters the globe. So just remember whenever you're doing any type of testing that it is posterior to the rectus muscles. Um, so most commonly, these pediatric eye injuries are caused by a sharp object or knife. Now, as we can tell, majority of can be caused by the patient themselves or a sibling. There is a three to five increased risk for males. Now, there is a very poor prognosis of vision in these patients. About half of them will have better than 20-40 vision, and that means about half will have worse than 20-40 vision. There is an increased risk of complications in the pediatric patients, amblyopia, need for additional surgeries, poor visual prognosis, prolonged hospitalization, and importantly, irregular stigmatism and scarring can cause both refractive and deprivational amblyopia. These are three photos of corneal lacerations. You can see full thickness corneal scarring through the visual axis. This would require a corneal transplant or at least a rigid grass permeable lens to control some of this. I had given a talk earlier on corneal transplants in pediatric patients, which you can refer to to talk to um, your patients about the risks of these types of surgeries in the pediatric population. Now, initial presentation is really important to try to figure out if these patients actually have an open globe injury. So we want to attempt age appropriate visual acuity. Sometimes the best we can get is fix and follow. Sometimes there is no way to check the vision in these kids. So we do want to check for the presence of an RAPD if possible. So that's a relative afferent pupillary de defect. We want to be able to do a thorough slit lamp and posterior segment exam. Look for Seidel positivity. Now, if the pressure is low, less than 10, that could be suspicious for an open globe. So we may want to defer the pressure check in these patients and also defer a dilated exam. In kids, it's always highly recommended to do an exam under anesthesia. The reasons that I would is I think if I could get none of the above information on a child in the emergency room, if there's visible expelled uveal tissue, if there's 360 degrees of bleeding or subconjunctival -con hemorrhage, if there's a complete hyphema or even a CT evidence of open globe injury. These are all reasons to take a patient to the operating room to do an exam under anesthesia. Now, other concerning signs of open globe injury are peaked pupil, subconcheme, shallow AC, hyphema, lens subluxation, and iridodialysis. And we'll show some photos of these images um, as the next slide. So this is a photo of a peaked pupil. You can see the pupil is peaking towards the superior portion. The second photo is a 360 subconjunctival hemorrhage. The third is a shallow AC. The fourth is a hyphema. Fifth is a lens subluxation. The last is an iridodialysis. So all concerning signs of an open globe injury, we need to have a high suspicion in our pediatric patients. Now, what type of imaging should we get in kids? It is different than adults. We do need to evaluate for open globe injury and IOFB. A bedside ultrasound can be deferred with a confirmed open globe injury because it does add additional pressure to the eye. Now, CT scans, there is a relative contraindication in pediatric patients because of the exposure to radiation. However, it's extremely sensitive to detect IOFB, so intraocular foreign bodies or orbital fractures. So if you have any suspicion, the risk does outweigh uh, so I'm sorry, the benefit does outweigh the risk for getting a CT scan. Now, if we're concerned about a foreign body with a lower density, like wood or vegetable matter, then we should order an MRI. However, we do need to ensure that the MRI is only ordered after ruling out the presence of a me metallic foreign body. So as you can see here in the images above, um, this patient on the right eye has, an, uh, has a hyper uh, echoic signal on the eye showing the intraocular foreign body. And on the second photo, we have a B scan that shows um, a posterior intraocular form body that was noted on B-scan. These are two other images that are concerning for open globe. As you can see here, we call this the raisin sign. So on this patient where the arrows are located, you can see the eye has shrunken in size, which makes us concerned for an open globe injury. And on the fourth, you see this fourth image, you'll see emphysema in the eye. So there's a pocket of air in the eye, again, concerning for open globe injury. And on this last image, another photo of emphysema in the globe. 
really suspicious for open globe injury. And on the last image here, the sixth image on this slide, you can see there is a protrusion or ectasia of the posterior globe um, on the right eye in this patient, which makes us very concerned about a posterior scleral rupture. Now, how do we repair or open globes uh, in these pediatric patients? The first thing, always place a rigid shield on the orbital bones. There are two ways of doing this. One is you can get a formal shield if it's present in the emergency room. The second way, if you don't have one, is to get a styrofoam cup, place it on the orbital bones. We do not want any pressure on the eye itself. Make sure the patient has strict NPO status, nothing to eat, update all their immunizations, especially tetanus if possible. Um, it's extremely important to have adequate pain control and nausea control because any type of Valsalva can, ex can expulse any intraocular contents. During the surgery, it's important to let the anesthesiologist know to avoid succinylcholine because that can also increase intraocular pressure and expulse intraocular contents. Um, I like to give broad spectrum IV antibiotics for 48 hours. We can do VANC and Ceftaz for ocular penetration. Typically for adults, we like to do a fluoroquinolone. However, in children, we like to avoid fluoroquinolones because um, of the risk of arthralgia and tendinopathy in children. So it's not approved for endophthalmitis in the pediatric population. So I would stick to vancomycin and ceftazidime. Now the primary surgical repair does involve a few steps. So the visual outcome of these patients depends on the extent and the location of the injury. So typically when you read papers on open globe outcomes, the eye is divided into three zones. One is injury from the white to white or from the entire aspect of the cornea um, from one limbus to the other. Zone two is the anterior five millimeters of sclera. So from the limbus back five millimeters through the anterior sclera. And then zone three is anything posterior to the limbus. So although the most common injury is in zone one, because that's the area that's most exposed, there is the worst, for, worst visual prognosis in zone three, especially if there is an associated retinal detachment. For these surgical repairs, we do want to perform them emergently in children. Any delay is associated with worse visual outcomes and higher risk of endophthalmitis. Our goals of surgery are to first reposit any prolapsed intraocular tissue, debris, necrotic tissue, close the, primary, close the wound primarily if possible. You could also consider a patch graft. If there's any IOFB intraocular foreign body in the anterior segment, we do need to remove it. And if it, there is one in the posterior segment, it is controversial when to remove it. You could either do it with an early pars plantar vitrectomy if you have a retinal surgeon at hand. I'm not a retinal surgeon, so I do need to refer these out. Um, and then the presence of vitreous hemorrhage is also controversial as to when to remove it. Some patients, some surgeons will do it early and some will wait a few weeks to allow it to clear on its own. When we think about pediatric patients with open globe repair, there are a few considerations. We don't want these kids to have multiple anesthesia episodes. We would like to remove the cataract at the same time and possibly implant an IOL to clear the visual access and minimize amblyopia. There have not been any studies on, uh, on children for intravitreal antibiotic use for endophthalmitis prevention. Now adults, there have been studies that have shown intravitreal antibiotics are beneficial only in the presence of an intraocular form body and these antibiotics would be vancomycin and ceftazidime injected at the end of the case. However, we do know that intravitreal antibiotics or any type of intravitreal injections do have a risk of worsening retinal detachment or even um, causing a choroidal detachment. So what I do recommend is to give some subconjunctival antibiotics to children. There is a lower risk of manipulation of intraocular contents. And then after the surgery is completely repaired, make sure to refer these patients promptly to a pediatric ophthalmologist for amblyopia management. Now the prognosis, it's really dependent um, on a few things. So first is the presenting visual acuity. If it's poor, then unfortunately the final visual acuity is, is more likely to be poor and same, same with uh, improved visual acuity on presentation. About 50% of patients, again, will have better vision in developed countries. However, in developing countries, the percentage is much lower Poorer visual outcomes are associated with endophthalmitis, with retinal detachment, vitreous hemorrhage, poor presenting visual acuity, and zone three involvement. Um, now, ocular trauma is a common cause of retinal detachment in the pediatric population. There is a really high risk of recurrent retinal detachment and vitreous hemorrhage. If we look at this image over here on the left, you can see that the postoperative complications 
leading to retinal detachment after open globe injury can cause tysis, non-attachment, band keratopathy, rubiosis, vitreous hemorrhage, secondary glaucoma, or cirrhosis. So whenever I see these types of patients, counseling the parents onto the prognosis is very, very important. When we look at um, patients that have open globe injury that have poor outcomes, you can see that patients that have um, some of the demographics that we just discussed, young age, um, zone three posterior, long wound length, lens rupture, vitreous hemorrhage, retinal detachment, and ophthalmitis. These are all things that we need to be thinking about when we see these patients to allow us to counsel the patients and the parents as to how their eyes are going to do even after primary surgical repair. Now, retinal detachment after open globe is a serious issue. It can occur at any time after trauma. It can also occur many years after. It can be very difficult to examine these patients with a dilated fundus exam. So we do recommend screening these patients with the B-scan. Unfortunately, there's a low rate of anatomic success after open globe um, um, surgery. I'm sorry, after retinal detachment, reattachment surgery. And it doesn't necessarily correlate with functional outcome. So the poor visual outcomes associated are if the vision is poor to begin with, if the RD is diagnosed by B-scan, meaning it's probably been there for some time, if there's proliferative vitreoretinopathy grade C or worse, if there's a total retinal detachment, if the macula is off, it does cause a high risk of proliferative vitreoretinopathy. And unfortunately, unsuccessful RD repair can lead to tysis bulbi. So one of the questions that I had seen was how can we prevent tysis in these patients? And I think the, the best thing that we can do is be very aggressive about trying to reattach the retina um, when we do see retinal detachment after open globe injuries. Now the pediatric ocular trauma score, um, we can see here, it does predict the visual acuity based on various pre-op known risk factors. It hasn't been validated as well as the um, ocular trauma score or the OTS for adults. And that's because it is difficulty, difficult to test pre-op vision or the presence of an APD in children. So when we are unable to test that, what we do is give it a corresponding score. We multiply the age and the zone by two and we subtract the corresponding pathologies. Um, you can see here all of the pathologies that are listed and how many points are given or subtracted. And this is another way that we can really prognosticate how our children are going to do after significant trauma. Moving on to the next section, let's talk about closed globe injuries. Now, these can further be subdivided into two categories. Um, and that can be subdivided into anterior segment injury. We'll talk about hyphemas, traumatic cataracts, traumatic strabismus, and also posterior segment injuries. I'm not a posterior segment surgeon, so we'll briefly go over vitreous hemorrhage, commotion retinae, and retinal detachments. Now, our poll question number three is how closely would you follow a traumatic hyphema? Now, I know it is dif different for adults versus kids, but would you admit the patient and follow daily? Would you follow daily as outpatient? Would you follow daily for the first three to five days, then at decreasing intervals? Or would you base it on the existence of other ocular comorbidities? Now, there's actually no right answer for this. So let's see how um, you all feel. Please vote now. So it looks like um, there is a, a pretty even distribution of admitting the patient and follow daily, um, as well as uh, daily for the first three to five days and then decreasing intervals. Looking at tra traumatic hyphemas, again, there isn't a consensus on how to follow these patients, but we'll go over some, um, some of the recent literature. This is caused by contraction and expansion of the globe after a globe injury which then damages the ciliary and iris vessels and causes a hyphema. This can cause numerous vision-threatening consequences, including ocular hypertension, which can lead to permanent vision loss. Um, acutely, ocular hypertension can be due to blood volume in the AC, or later it can be due to clogging of the trabecular meshwork with fibrin or a clot. It can also be due to steroid response or angle dysfunction. This can occur in about 20 patients with closed globe injury. So that's a significant number and nearly a fourth can, uh, could potentially require surgery to control the pressure. Now for a long-term um, uh, monitoring these patients, it's important to know that deprivational amblyopia can also be caused if there is persistent occlusion of the visual axis. 
When we look at this table one, these are demographics of patients with closed globe injuries and hyphema. As you can see, the median age is about 11 years old, predominantly male. Um, the races are as identified. <clears throat> and you can see that a lot of times they, we are monitoring these patients for many, many years. Table two over here will give us um, clinical characteristics of children. So most of the time you'll see microhyphemas, which is just circulating red blood cells in the anterior chamber. Um, grade one is uh, a micro um, a hyphema less than about one millimeter. So those are the, typically the two most common hyphemas. And that's extremely important because if you are not looking at these patients very, um, uh, very closely under a slit lamp condition, it could be very easy to miss these microhyphemas and grade one hyphemas, which can cause permanent vision loss. There can be a high risk of concurrent eye injuries, especially commotio retinae, um, as well as pupil damage. Um, vitreous hemorrhage is also highly associated with, um, with uh, hyphema. So it's important to have a really low index of suspicion and to examine the entire eye completely when presented with these patients. Um, we can also have um, a potential of angle recession. It can be difficult to perform gonioscopy on pediatric patients. So as you can see here in this study, about a third of patients, they were not even able to do gonioscopy. Um, however, there is a risk of angle trauma. About a third of patients had angle trauma um, greater than 100 degrees and about the same lesson. Now, the incidence of ocular hypertension in this study was about 40%. So half of these patients um, approximately had some high pressures. And the incidence of rebleed, although we are taught a lot about rebleeding, as you can see here, it's very low, about 5%. When we look at the timing of ocular hypertension, we can divide it into three subcategories. The first category is the acute period. It happens through day one through seven. So these are when we are following the patients either daily or, with, or daily for the first few days, and then um, after day three to five, decreasing the intervals. Now, if you have pupil damage, that can predict IOP elevation in about 40.5%. So if you are seeing any type of iris sphincter damage, if you're seeing any type of traumatic medriasis, if you're seeing iridodialysis, these are patients that we actually need to be watching more closely than patients that do not have any type of um, anterior segment damage in the acute period. If we move to the second section, the subacute period, this is from day 28 to day, I'm sorry, from day eight to day 28. So usually the first um, two to three weeks after injury. So this shows that ocular hypertension at initial presentation, so if the pressure is higher than 21, or if there's a pressure difference between the eyes of 10 millimeters or more, that will present, uh, predict later ocular hypertension in these patients. So it's important to look at that. Now the late period is more than a month out. So we are following these hyphema patients for many um, months, if not years. The presence of iridodialysis and traumatic cataract is what pre uh, predicts later ocular hypertension. So the, right over here, if you look at this graphic, you can see the number of ocular hypertension episodes in the acute period is actually the highest. And if we follow the next arrow, which is between day eight to 28, you can see the incidence of ocular hypertension goes down. And then finally, greater than day 28 is when the incidence of ocular hypertension will decrease the most. And that's why it's extremely important to follow these hyphema patients so closely within the first few days after their presentation of hyphema in order to prevent irreversible vision loss from ocular hypertension. Now, this is a risk stratification tool. This was put out by Dr. Shaw's group from Boston Children's, which I think is extremely important. It's something that we should all have on hand with us. If we have a pediatric patient that's less than 18 years old with a closed globe injury with hyphema, if you go down this pathway, you can really determine when and how often to see the patients. So if the patient has hyphema grade three or four or sickle cell disease or trait, this, these are extremely high-risk patients. We can't even use the surveillance for this because we need to be monitoring them much more closely. Whereas if there is ocular hypertension or if you're unable to um, gauge the IOP, you're going to follow these patients every one to two days until stable. But if there's not ocular hypertension or pupil damage, you can actually wait until about day five to seven because the risk of ocular hypertension is a little bit lower. Now, if we move down to the subacute phase, if you have high pressure more than 21 on presentation, or topical steroid use, or you're uncertain, you can evaluate um, between 
um, 10 to 12 days or at least weekly until stable. But if not, then you can actually push it back even further to 14 to 21 days. Now on the late phase, if you have iridodialysis, traumatic cataract, angle recession, or we don't know if they have any angle recession because the kid is uh, difficult to cooperate, then um, we want to evaluate them 90 days or sooner. If not, then um, we can continue to follow down this algorithm. So this is readily available online. Um, and I think it is a, an extremely useful tool. That way we are not following these patients unnecessarily. Now, how do we treat traumatic hyphemas? I can really divide this into two categories that can cause permanent vision loss. We talked about the uncontrolled, uncontrolled IOP. First thing we wanna do is sickle prep or whatever type of testing you have in your um, facility because this will monitor, this will dictate how closely you monitor the patient. If the pressure is higher than 50 for five days, <clears throat> or if it's higher than 25 for 24 hours for patients that are either sickle cell positive or even sickle cell trait, we need to have adequate control. And you can do this through maximal glaucoma eye drops. And we do need to watch these patients more closely. I do recommend avoiding alpha agonists in children less than two years of age due to somnolence, lethargy, and um, brain issues. And we do recommend admitting patient for daily IOP checks if you are not able to do this as an outpatient. Um, if the pressure is high, uncontrolled, we do consider an early AC washout or a paracentesis to lower the pressure. Looking to the next section, deprivational amblyopia is another risk of permanent vision loss in these patients. And that can occur due to prolonged obscuration of the visual access. That could be because the patient presented late, or this tra traumatic hyphema is a complete eight ball hyphema that's blocking the visual access and has not been cleared. So we do recommend early surgical intervention, and this could be different from your adult patients. And that's because we don't want to have permanent vision loss. I like to perform an AC washout either through bimanual irrigation aspiration or vitrectomy. I like to do an anterior vitrectomy if there are any presence of clots. We can also think about injecting a fibrinolytic at the end of the case to prevent um, to further break down these clots. Um, some of the glaucoma specialists would like to do a trabeculectomy, so actually preventing an out or allowing an outflow um, through the trabecular meshwork to bypass and prevent this IOP from spiking again. Um, one consideration, which is also controversial, is the presence of a peripheral iridectomy. Now, this is really only for patients with hy complete hyphemas. You could consider per peripheral iridectomy to prevent pu future pupillary block. And I have seen this done primarily in patients that receive a trabeculectomy. Traumatic cataracts, so this is our next category. This does occur in about 12 to 29% of pediatric patients, and it is actually a treatable cause of vision loss, which is really encouraging. Typically, it can be due to self-injury type of behavior, or bilateral cataracts can also be associated with RD. And as we all know, RD, uh, the association of retinal detachments will lead to poor visual outcome and recovery. If there's any type of difficulty in examining the patients, I do recommend an exam under anesthesia. Now there's no consensus regarding many things with these types of surgery, the timing of surgery, IOL placement, um, approach for surgery. Um, but I think it is pretty well established that we should observe if the trauma is peripheral or less than three millimeters of the central visual axis. So the table over here on the left um, looks at demographic characteristics of patients with traumatic cataracts. As you can see here, predominantly male, uh, mostly around about four to eight years of age, mostly are unilateral cataracts. Both eyes are equally affected. And you can see that self-injury can be caused, accidents can cause it, and then actually peers uh, will cause a lot of these injuries. And you can see all those mechanisms over there on the left as well. When we think about traumatic cataracts, there are options for surgical repair. So the three goals, uh, the three options are to first close the corneal laceration if there is associated corneal laceration and defer the cataract surgery for later. Number two, close the corneal laceration and remove the cataract and then leave the IA phagic. This could be a preferred option, um, especially in children if you're not able to get any type of intraocular lens calculations especially if there is corneal scarring, because you can treat the corneal scarring with a rigid gas permeable lens, and you can also treat the aphakia with a rigid gas permeable lens. The third option would be to close the corneal laceration, remove the cataract, and place an IOL. This is typically what we can do for older patients, where we are able to accurately measure the intraocular lens power that would be required for this patient. So if you take a look over here, 
um, we do tend to determine the IOL power based off charts like the one on the left. Now, it is up to the surgeon's discretion as to whether we want to place the lens or not. We need to weigh the risk of amblyopia with repeat anesthesia episodes and the likelihood of even having this patient return for additional surgery. If you're concerned that the family or the parent may not return, then we should be repair we should be putting in an IOL at the same time. We can measure the fellow eye and choose the IOL based off the age of the patient. So as I can see here, when the patient is younger, we expect myopization of the eye. So we do want to aim for a more hyperopic target the younger the patient is. We should consider the possibility of a corneal transplant in the future and all the risks associated with that. And I do want to encourage you to not implant an IOL in any sort of patient where there could be a risk of infection due to an open globe injury. Now for this traumatic cataract surgery, what we could consider is early rehabilitation of the visual access. We do want to minimize deprivational amblyopia development. Now the most, now traumatic cataract surgery is actually the most common cause of severe loss, vision loss after open globe injury. And there is a high risk of complications associated with uveitis, pupillary ca capture of the IOL, IOL dislocation or tilt or visual access opacification. Looking at these photos, typically what people say is this traumatic stellate cataract that you see with um, trauma. However, I really haven't seen a lot of this type of cataract in my practice after trauma. What I typically see is violation of the anterior capsule, like in the second image. And once we remove this cataract, it's actually a very soft gelatinous cataract, which can be removed easily with bimanual irrigation aspiration. You will see a clear visual access, but there will be scar tissue from the anterior capsule. You can also, uh, and that would be a, a total traumatic cataract. You can also have a localized traumatic cataract as shown in the third set of images, um, which where the cataract is isolated to one quadrant in the peripheral um, lens. But as you can see here, over time, it does develop to have some posterior changes. So surgery would involve removing that as well. And you can see how much scar tissue there is associated even after the removal um, of this dense cataract. So tips to do traumatic cataract surgery. I will always want to say tripan blue really for any type of complex cataract surgery. Tripan blue for anterior capsular visualization. We should consider doing posterior opt optic capture if you can. And that's really because the lens capsule is so unstable in these patients. We want to ensure that the lens will stay in the, in the right position over this children's life. You could consider an anterior banded capsule technique where you leave a band of anterior capsule in front of the lens in order to really capture the lens between the anterior and posterior capsule in order to prevent this lens from migrating over time. I always like to do a primary posterior capsulotomy and anterior vitrectomy in any patient, most likely, uh, most commonly under the age of eight or someone where I'm concerned I cannot do a YAG capsulotomy later on. We do need to uh, do early treatment of amblyopia with contact lenses, glasses, patching, or atropine penalization. And if you do not feel comfortable doing this after surgery, please refer to your pediatric ophthalmology colleague, because this is really the best way to improve the visual um, development of the children. Even if you do the surgery, but you don't treat the amblyopia, unfortunately, the child is not going to do as well as if we do treat the uh, amblyopia early. Again, it's okay to leave aphakic. This is not a loss at all to the patient. We do like to treat them with a hard contact lens for their irregular astigmatism in order to mis minimize their risk of refractive and deprivational amblyopia. Here's another graphic showing the anterior banded technique using um, uh, irrigation aspiration to remove the cataract after the corneal laceration has been repaired. And you can see there's a thin band of um, anterior capsule left in the center of the lens, and that can prevent lens from decentering or tilting over the long term of the patient. Now, going back to our favorite patient, our eight year old with a corneal uh, laceration as well as a traumatic cataract. I just saw her in clinic yesterday. So my approach for the corneal laceration is going to be, uh, first I'll do a corneal laceration repair with tenol nylon full thickness through um, this laceration. And then um, for the traumatic cataract, my plan is since she is an eight year old, I will need to do a cataract aspiration. I will use tripan, Kelon 5. Now the eye wall we, calculations, we were unable to do on the right eye. So I'm gonna use the fellow eye. It's really important to be extremely pre well prepared for these surgeries. You should have a one piece eye wall calculation 
um, formulate it a three piece. We may need to put in the sulcus. We may need to capture it. Um, I would, I'm planning on doing a posterior capsulotomy, anterior vitrectomy, and based off her age, we're going to target plus one. Um, and I did discuss with mom multiple, multiple times that she will need glasses for the rest of her life for her visual development. Now, looking at um, our next topic, traumatic strabismus. So when we look at strabismus, this can cause isolated injury with glo without globe trauma, and it can also be associated during the open globe repair. It can result from damage to the supranuclear structures, the ocular motor nerves, or the extraocular muscles themselves. And you can also have a subtype of sensory exotropia after vision loss. We do not recommend strabismus surgery for sensory exotropia because it will recur. Now, orbital fractures are a really common cause of this, and it can lead to muscle contusion, traumatic um, uh, disinsertion, or laceration of the muscle. As you can see um, over here, what we are seeing here is uh, isolated traumatic strabismus to this uh, muscle injury, the orbital part, which can cause issues. The orbital wall trauma will cause most commonly issues with the inferior rectus, inferior oblique, the medial rectus, and superior oblique. Now, muscle entrapment in children is a surgical emergency. What happens is in kids, they have a linear, minimally displaced fracture. It traps the extraocular muscle and causes ischemia. You will have positive force duction testing due to this restrictive strabismus. And it's actually called a white-eyed floor fracture. So you won't see much on the eye, minimal damage, minimal bruising, minimal subconscious hemorrhage. However, when the patient looks up, we will trigger the oculobradycardiac reflex. Nausea and vomiting is 75% specific. So if you see it in these patients, definitely think of muscle entrapment. We also want to be um, concerned about syncope or bradycardia, which can result. Looking at some of these CT scans, what we see is supraorbital um, orbital fractures, both in the um, inferior uh, wall as well as the medial wall, which does cause this patient, um, I'm sorry, you're not able to see that, but to, to not be able to look up. And that's because she has a green stick trapped or fracture on the inferior wall, which is trapping the muscle. And you can see the muscle herniating through that area through the inferior orbital wall. Now the surgical repair for this it is extremely important that any lacerations, you have to attempt to retrieve both ends of the muscle and reattach it with non-absorbable suture. You may require an anterior orbitotomy to find these muscles, especially the medial rectus, because that does tend to telescope through the muscle, um, through the, the capsule of the muscle into the anterior orbit because of its lack of attachment to any other extraocular muscles. You should only consider a muscle transposition in the late term, nothing acutely, and only if the muscle cannot be found because the results are inferior to last um, to uh, retrieving any type of muscle that you can find. If you do a muscle transposition, there's only a small area of binocular fusion that can result, and there is a risk of anterior segment ischemia with full tendon transposition, especially if you are transposing multiple muscles. Now, the timing of repair is controversial. Um, Preferably, I like to do early repair in seven to within seven to 10 days. It does prevent the contracture of the antagonist, but you can delay the repair up to five to six weeks to wait for resolution of any type of edema within the muscle or hemorrhage within the muscle. This is an extremely well-written document um, by Dr. Mo Linari. Um, there isn't a lot of information out there if you do literature searches on strabismus following extraocular muscle trauma. Um, but as you can see here, uh, Dr. Molinari did an excellent uh, Knights Templar Foundation article. If you would like to look, uh, look up this article and read it about traumatic strabismus, I, th I think you'll find a lot of really good points about surgical repair for strabismus. Now, looking at these patients, you can see here um, the first photo, this patient has a right brown syndrome. He has damage to the supraocular muscle or tendon, and he's adopted a head position. So anyone that walks into your office that has this type of head position after trauma, you should be highly suspicious of a traumatic um, strabismus. Looking at the next graphic, um, you can see that this patient actually had a hematoma in her inferior oblique. So the first image shows the inferior, I'm sorry, the inferior rectus without any type of hematoma. And after the trauma, she did develop um, a hematoma. Now these types of patients, we do want to observe. Looking at the photos of the lady to the left, you can see that four days post-trauma, she was not able to introduct the eye. 
15 days she was and one month post-trauma, that uh, hematoma went away. So we do need to have a high index of suspicion for patients that do have any type of strabismus after trauma. Now looking at agnetsal injury, this is um, typically what we see with the uh, dog bite injuries. It occurs in about 15% of patients that are less than four years old. And that's really because of their short stature, their proximity to the dog's face and underdeveloped motor skills. The majority actually occur on the owner's property with pit bulls, and there is a high risk of infection because of the antibody injury. I do highly recommend um, irrigation. It does decrease risk by 90% with a 30 ml syringe and at least 150 ml into the area of injury. We also like to recommend antibiotics for up to five days. You can see here, the top photo shows a non cannulicular involving injury, which can be repaired by primary wound closure. However, the second photo, if there is lid margin injury, the lid margin needs to be reapproximated. And in the third photo, if there is cannulicular injury, we'll discuss that moving forward. Now for the surgical repair, there is a rare association with open globe injury, but if it is present, it should be repaired first. There's a high risk of cannulicular involvement because the cannuliculus is the, is the weakest point of the eyelid. Any type of shearing forces can cause trauma to the cannuliculus. What I like to do is a, um, a monocannulicular repair. This is a mini Minoka stent. You can see the, the cartoon in the Fos photograph, which has this neck and bulb that rests on top of the eyelid margin. And it can be advanced once the eyelid margin has been reapproximated with sutures. Um, the other option is to locate both ends of the cannuliculus, put the um, probe in first, follow it with the uh, stent and then suture around it. It can be difficult to, accept, to assess cannulicular involvement. You may need to probe under anesthesia. We did this a ton in my fellowship. Um, any type of eyelid injury that's close to either the upper or lower cannuliculus may need probing under anesthesia. Less than 5% of these can be associated with floor fractures, so it's important to have a high index of suspicion as well. Now, the second photo over here shows a bicannulicular stent, which can be used for injuries in one cannuliculus or with both. It does tend to go through the upper and lower cannuliculus, and then the rest of the um, tube rests in the nasal passages. And as you see here on this graphic on the left, you'll be able to see a little bit of tube in between the upper and lower lids that does highlight the presence of this tube. Now, chemical injuries, these are really common injuries that we see in kids. Um, so our last poll question is, how do you initially approach chemical injuries in children? Would you like to obtain a history, then start an eye exam, wait for sedation, and then perform EUA, irrigate, 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 or try to obtain a sample of the chemical? Perfect. Everyone likes to irrigate. Wonderful. That means we can move through this section a little bit more quickly. So it's extremely important to know that toddlers one to two years of age are at the most risk for chemical eye injury even 13 times higher than seven-year-olds. 90% of these are preventable. It's really due to proximity to household cleaning agents or laundry detergent pods. And um, the injury can continue to burn the eye after contact. Alkalis are much more dangerous than acids. And spray bottles, kids think they're really interesting. They like to spray them at their face. That can be really high risk as well. Whenever you see this, flush the eye immediately with water for 15 to 30 minutes. And you can see lists of common acids and alkalis over here on the side. <clears throat> now, how do we irrigate these eyes in the emergency room? It's extremely important to tilt the head over a water basin. You wanna have an infusion set above the eye and drip the water from the inner canthus to the outer canthus. Now, if there's a normal pH, you wanna continue irrigation until neutralized. If you're unable to test the pH in children, keep irrigating with two liters of 0.9% saline. You wanna check for an epi defect and then treat with broad spectrum topical antibiotics as well as steroids to induce inflammation, frequent topical tears, cycloplegia for comfort, extensive scarring may require a limbal stem cell transplant and complications can be really um, vision threatening for the rest of their life as listed below. <clears throat> These are all of the stages of limbal involvement. As you can see here, you can go from zero lim limbal involvement to total limbal involvement which can cause corneal opacification, pseudoterygium, secondary glaucoma, and really poor visual prognosis. If we look at a patient that has firework injuries, it's very similar to, to chemical injuries. This was a, a young teenage patient who I saw after July 4th injuries. He presented 
with entropion, total grade for um, opacification of the cornea and limbal involvement. He initially had um, the upper lid, as you can see here, it was uh, entropic. He had an entropion repair. Next, he had um, symblepharon that developed later on. Finally, we removed the symblepharon, and then he had the extensive area of limbal stem cell deficiency inferiorly. We did a limbal stem cell transplant, and as you can see in the last photo, his cornea is still very opacified, but at least now he's seeing 2,400, and our goal is to get him into a full corneal transplant or a rigid gas permeable lens in order to uh, improve his vision. But it's taken two years to get to this point, and his vision will always be subnormal in this eye. So firework injury prevention is key. So our last section will be sequelae of trauma. We're really just gonna discuss how to prevent eye trauma. Um, prevention is much better than a cure. Now, this type of injury most commonly occurs at school or during play. For any type of patient that's had trauma in the past, anyone that's monocular, especially anyone that's had a corneal transplant, I always recommend sports frame or polycarbonate lenses for all contact sports. And quite honestly, I do recommend that they wear polycarbonate lenses all the time because trauma can happen anytime, even when we're unsuspecting. For any type of firework injury, please do not allow children anywhere near fireworks, especially bottle rockets. You can see how bad the injury was on our last patient. And we really don't want our children to be having this type of visual compromise. During driving, there should be age appropriate seatbelt use. Children under 12 years of age should never sit in the front of, uh, of driving vehicles. They should be in the back seat with seatbelts. Now, parental counseling is something that we should always be aware of. Serious injury is not always obvious. So if our parents are having any type of doubt, I do encourage them to seek medical care immediately. Keep all types of cleaning agents on a high shelf and locked away. Do not allow any type of interaction with unknown dogs if possible. After the injury, always avoid the patients and the parents to avoid the following. No touching, no rubbing, no eye pressure to the eye remove any object from inside the eye. Please don't apply any ointment or medications that they may have lying around the house. Gently cover any open wounds. Similar to the photo that I showed at the beginning, if you do not have an eye patch at home, advise the parents to tape a styrofoam cup to the eye before presenting to any type of emergency facility. Now the visual outcomes are dependent on the treatment of amblyopia. So it's extremely important that once this injury has been stabilized in the immediate period, to get them over to a pediatric ophthalmologist in order to treat their amblyopia. Parents are always asking how to flush eyes for their kids. So these are a few tips. In the shower, I do encourage you to let the warm water wash over the eye. Just keep the eye looking up. And the irrigation should occur for about 10 minutes if possible. In the sink, you can bend the head over and place the eyes under running water to flush them. They can use a bowl of water and place the eyes in there while blinking. Now, I don't know if your child would be able to do that, but we can always encourage our parents to or you can place a small cup of water over the eye and tilt the head to the side. And that is um, another way that we can flush uh, the eye after any type of chemical injury and things that we can avoid um, long-term damage to our patients. Well, thank you so much. That's the last of my slides. I do encourage you um, to email me if you have any questions or concerns. I'm gonna pop up the questions from our presentation today. So this is a great question. How do you treat traumatic optic neuropathy? What's the dose of IV steroids? So traumatic optic neuropathy in children is not something that we would treat acutely. Um, the, present, the treatment of IV methylprednisone is controversial even in adults. Um, we like to dose methylpred one mg per keg, but I really would get my uh, neuro-ophthalmology colleagues involved because it's really difficult to detect traumatic optic neuropathy in the early onset. Um, however, we have been known to treat it um, in adults. There haven't really been any good studies for children, but again, the dose would be um, IV methylpred one mg per keg. Um, sympathetic ophthalmia, that's another great question. So sympathetic ophthalmia, for those that are not aware, is when um, the fellow eye that has not been involved with the initial trauma does develop a granulomatous inflammatory response which is a response of the body attacking that eye in association with injury to the first eye. Now, um, sympathetic ophthalmia, it has been shown to occur even 70 years after the initial injury. So it's extremely important, again, to counsel the patients. If there's any type of uvial compromise um, in my patients, I will discuss the risk of symp sympathetic ophthalmia with the parents and the children. 
Now, the the unfortunate treatment for sympathetic ophthalmia is an enucleation, and that's why we don't take this lightly. The treatment would actually involve removing the eye that has been damaged in order to prevent the sympathetic ophthalmia from getting to the fellow eye. And as a kid, obviously, the parents are going to be completely hesitant. But if there's no useful vision in the eye that's damaged, if there was a lot of uveal prolapse, um, the exposure of the uvea is actually what causes the highest risk of sympathetic ophthalmia. And so if there's ex uveal prolapse and extremely poor vision in the initially injured eye, that's when I would talk to the parents about removing the eye. Everyone I've talked to has been extremely hesitant. Um, however, again, the risk of sympathetic ophthalmia will be there for the rest of the child's life. So it's really important to be able to have this conversation with our parents. Um, I'm gonna go through some of these, I'm sorry, this is just moving. Okay, so how would you treat irregular astigmatism con caused by a wound scar? That's a great question. Um, there are really different ways of treating it. The first would be, um, I would always, if the patient allows, try a rigid gas permeable lens or a scleral lens. I've seen extremely um, surprising results with this hard lens in terms of treating up to eight diopters of irregular astigmatism. So partnering with our optometry colleagues and really just getting an RGP on the eye to see how much the vision can improve. A lot of times that improves the vision enough where you don't need to do surgery. Now, if the patient is not tolerating an RGP lens, if they're very young, the next option would really only be a corneal transplant surgery. And that's a really big surgery because it does involve drops and monitoring for the rest of your life. Um, so those are really the two major ways that you can treat it. Now, there are other ways that you can do it by doing peripheral relaxing um, incisions from irregular astigmatism. You can also do compression sutures on the area that they have irregular astigmatism. And then the last way is to actually remove the sutures in a way to treat the regular irregular astigmatism. Um, but I'm assuming that your question is referring to after all the sutures are out. Now in kids, the issue is the cornea keeps growing and changing. So there's really no way to treat this completely, um, but I think managing it with a rigid gas permeable lens is really the easiest option initially. And then after that, I talk to patients about more um, surgical treatments of the, uh, the irregular astigmatism. Um, how to treat a patient with severe inflammation with corneal epithelial defect? Um, that's a great question. I think that the first treatment with a corneal epithelial defect is to determine if, uh, sorry, so determine what caused the uh, epithelial defect. Um, if it is a chemical, chemically induced defect versus a traumatic defect, like an actual mechanism of injury to the eye, the chemical induced defect, I would do steroids early because steroids have been shown to decrease the keratinolysis effect. So steroids only for the first 10 days, I would do steroids very frequently, artificial tears frequently, and of course, cover them with a the topical antibiotic in the immediate period. Now, if there was only a trauma that caused the epithelial defect, and there was no chemical injury associated with it, I would actually just treat it with antibiotics first, allow the epithelial defect to heal and then treat the um, inflammation with steroids, because we don't want to propagate any infection by causing the um, Inflammation uh, by cause by by the steroids propagating the um, the in infection from uh, occurring and getting worse over time. Next question: uh, If there's a pediatric hyphema and the children is not cooperative for a posterior segment exam, do we need an EUA? I would say yes. So um, there is definitely a role for an EUA in these types of patients. Now, I wouldn't say it's exactly a hundred percent. We'll need an EUA if you have a patient that you have good vision on. If you're able to get a good slit lamp exam and determine the grade of hyphema, if you're able to um, check the IOP, that's really the most important. If they are not able to get an IOP, you absolutely have to take them for an exam under anesthesia because as we know, even micro hyphemas have a high risk of uncontrolled intraocular pressure. Now for the posterior segment exam, the reason I would say they need an EUA is because we need to assess the cup to disc. If the patient has a cup to disc of 0.9, and they have a pressure that's minimally elevated, that's very different from a patient that has a cup to disc ratio of 0.1 or 0.2, where there is a lot of optic nerve there that will be a buffer against any type of damage. 
Additionally, as we saw during the presentations, hyphemas can be associated with retinal detachments. They can be associated with vitreous hemorrhage. We need to know if these are things that are going on concurrently with our patient. So if you can only see that there is a hyphema, but you cannot see anything else about the eye, I would not know personally how to treat the IOP if I don't know the cup to disc ratio and if I don't know what else is going on inside of the eye. So, okay, um, are you recommending IOL in primary repair? If yes, then what about inflammation, especially in kids? And comment on primary versus secondary IOL, wonderful. Um, I would, so it really depends on the, the patient. So for example, I presented an eight-year-old patient today that has a small corneal laceration. They have a traumatic cataract, but I'm able to get calculations. The patient's eight years old and there's not a ton of inflammation in her eye. So I actually am going to um, do primary corneal laceration repair and I'm going to take out the cataract and I'm going to put an IOL. But I definitely don't think that that's something that we need to do in every single patient. If the child is younger, if you cannot get appropriate IOL calculations, if you're concerned about intraocular inflammation, uveitis, infection, then please remove the cataract, but do not place an intraocular lens in this patient. Um, secondary IOL implantation is a wonderful way to treat these patients later on. Um, if you are able to preserve the capsule, any part of the capsule, um, then what we can do is go back in and place a three-piece lens in the sulcus if there is any adequate capsular support, which is a wonderful way to help treat this patient long term. Furthermore, if we are going forward with um, leaving the patient aphakic, then contact lenses are another great option, especially if they have large corneal scarring, irregular astigmatism. The uh, aphakic contact lens can treat not only the high um, degree of hyperopia that's going to be occurring in these aphakic patients, but also the high irregular astigmatism. So I think um, aphakic glasses, contact lenses are wonderful. If you are able to get calcs on a patient and put in a lens in a tolerating patient, I think that's completely fine during a primary repair. And I think secondary IOL implantation is also a great option. A lot of times if I'm worried that there is no capsular support, if you have any retinal colleagues that you can go in with, they can do a full vitrectomy, pars plana vitrectomy. Um, and then you can do a secondary implant, sulcus fixated. Um, there are a few different techniques that you can do. Um, Acrios um, with a Gore-Tex suture is a great four point fixation technique. There are a lot of videos on YouTube that uses this Acrios lens. There's a Yamane technique, which is the intrahaptic scleral um, uh, scler fixation with a flanged technique. Um, I would not recommend doing an ACIOL in kids just because of the risk of glaucoma in the long term. But there's also the artisan lens, the iris fix, fixated cloud cloud. There's a ton of secondary IOL implants that can be used. And all are great options, especially if you don't feel comfortable placing an IOL um, initially for these patients. After chemical injuries, uh, even though irrigation is important, what if the patient has open globe injury as well? Should we examine first? Um, you know, that's, that's actually, a, that's a good point. Um, I think the, I have not typically seen a chemical injury associated with an open globe injury. Um, and I think if there was a risk of, if I did have a concern for an open globe injury, then, then of course I would examine first. Um, but based off the, the, um, initial quick glance, if I pull apart the lids, the anterior segment looks fine, posterior segment looks fine, I would go ahead and start irrigating. Now, if I see a large area of corneal laceration or scleral laceration, I would still irrigate. I think it's extremely important because irrigation, especially with an alkali compound, will continue to dissolve the intraocular structures. So what I would do is irrigate very gently, very slowly, and as long as I could until I got the patient to the operating room, close the globe as fast as I can, um, but I still would irrigate uh, before um, uh, as much as possible in the in the early period. What chemical causes more danger, acid or alkaline? The answer is alkaline injuries because what they do is they actually saponify. They um, will basically melt the glow because they they don't pr provide a um, a precipitate, whereas the acid provides a precipitate. It uh, precipitates the materials of the eye together and provides a barrier. Um, whereas alkalines do not produce any type of barrier between the actual chemical and the eye, and they will continue causing injury if they are not washed out immediately. 
do you do ERG or VEP in a dense traumatic cataract? I love that question. Unfortunately, I don't have any access to ERG or VEP. Um, I think in the city where I live, there may be one location that does it in children, um, which would be really difficult uh, to get to um, for my patients. So I actually don't, but I think if you do have the ability to do ERG or VEP in a dense traumatic cataract, I think that's a wonderful way to assess especially if you are concerned about the, the, uh, the functioning of the retina. Um, I think that's a great way to assess retinal functioning be before doing it. Now, the, now, whether or not, or the, I'm sorry, the, based off the outcomes of the ERG or VEP is not going to affect my decision to do surgery. Even if I'm getting poor results on the ERG or VEP, I'm still going to do the traumatic cataract surgery because I know that's going to allow me to monitor the optic nerve. It's going to allow me to monitor the retinal status. So I will do surgery regardless of the ERG or VEP results, but unfortunately I just don't have access to that. Multifocal uh, IOL in children, there are some studies out for that. I typically don't do a multifocal lens in children. I will do a standard hyperopic age adjusted um, IOL power based off how young or old the patient is. Multifocals I think are um, controversial in children. They do decrease contrast sensitivity, um, which is important for visual development in children. However, I think it's, it's very variable. So anyone that has any type of corneal trauma or irregular astigmatism or really any other damage in the eye, multifocals are not good, good options for even adults in these issues. Multifocals are really good um, surgeries only for the most pristine eye that has a has a wonderful ocular surface, no dry eye, no, no even hint of ERM. Um, so even in adults, I think multifocals really, really only can be implanted in very small subset of patients, at least the multifocals that are available in the US. I know there are other multifocals available abroad. Now for children, especially after trauma, I think trauma is, is a contraindication for anyone to have a multifocal. Now, if it's a congenital cataract and you wanted to consider a multifocal, it's important to know that all IOLs are not FDA approved for children. So none of the studies have been done in children, at least in the United States. So we don't know the end result. Uh, multifocal lenses have a high risk of glare or halos. Um, and also, unless they are perfectly centered in the, in the eye, you're going to lose the multifocality of this lens. And in children, I think it's really important to realize that we have no idea what the refractive outcome will be in the long term. Maybe if the kid was a teenager and really wants to be glasses independent, you could consider it. But for someone younger, I would not consider a multifocal lens due to risk of IOL decentration and tilt as the eye grows and high risk of, IOL, of needing an IOL exchange. Would you stitch only a conjunctival rupture? Um, so I actually would go based off um, my strabismus history. So uh, when I was in training for any type of strabismus surgery, um, a conjunctival repair, we would really only do for last rate for um, incisions more than about 10 millimeters. Anything less than that, we would just cauterize or just leave it. Um, it hasn't really shown to, to make too much of a difference. So I kind of follow the same mentality for conjunctival ruptures. If it's a small rupture, less than about 10 millimeters, I typically will observe it unless the parents are really um, anxious and, and the kid has a high risk of rubbing the eyes. I would put a shield on that eye and encourage the family and the child not to rub or touch the eye and that will heal primarily. Um, the issue with this is that if you wanted to close the conjunctival in a kid, you're gonna have to take them to the operating room. So if the child is young and we're looking at the risk of multiple anesthesia episodes, I wouldn't really qualify this as, as requiring sutures. Now, if the rupture is greater than about 10 millimeters, if I'm concerned, if I cannot see anything past the conjunctiva, if I'm even a tiny bit concerned about a scl scleral um, violation or laceration, I would absolutely take them to the operating room to do an exploration of that area and then suture up the conjunctiva if needed. But if it's a simple conjunctival laceration, less than 10 millimeters, no other associated issues, the family, I think, um, is pretty reliable in returning, then I would leave it um, without any sutures. And typically I do like a 6-0 or a 7-0 plain gut suture. So for corneal sutures, um, when people are asking nylon or silk, I always do 10-0 nylon sutures for corneal suturing. Um, if you are suturing at the limbus to reapproximate the limbus, I would do 9-0 nylon. And then if you are reapproximating the sclera and closing scleral lacerations, I would do 8-0 nylon. You could consider 8-0 vicral, um, 
but in children, I would do 8O nylon because it will not loosen over time. Now, the important thing with the nylon sutures over the sclera is that the knots can erode through the conjunctiva. So it is important to make sure that the conjunctiva closes well over the area of the scleral laceration, and then make sure to close the conjunctival laceration. I like to do with um, adovipral, um, but you could also do a nylon suture to close the uh, conjunctival laceration as well, but you would need to remove those nylon sutures once the conjunctiva has healed. How, um, so which systemic antibiotics better for peds? Um, as, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation, I like to do vancomycin and a third generation cephalosporin or even a fourth generation cephalosporin. So um, ceftazidime and vancomycin are typically the systemic antibiotics that are used. Um, what's the principle of suturing the corneal wound involves the visual axis? That's a great question. Um, so typically if the corneal wound uh, involves a visual axis. If it's anything more than um, a straight laceration, if it's like a stellate or a V-shaped laceration, you always want to place the first suture at the apex of the incision. So if it's a V-shaped incision uh, laceration, you want to place the suture right at the tip of the V because that's going to approximate both edges of the laceration first. Um, Tenno nylon is the suture that you would use. And if it is in the visual axis, you want to place the smallest sutures in the center of the vision and increase the suture length as you go to the periphery of the cornea. So the center of the cornea, you're going to put a small suture, you're going to reapproximate that, and then you're going to bisect the rest of the um, laceration, put a stitch, and then continue bisecting it. Typically, the corneal wounds, you want about a one millimeter um, distance between your sutures in order to make it watertight. Now, if this, the corneal wound is very lacerated, it has a lot of irregular rough edges, you may find that you need to place even more sutures. Um, and if that's the case, you need to keep suturing until the laceration is completely watertight. And you can check that with a wax cell sponge, looking for fluid egress out of the interior chamber. You can also check it with a Seidel strip at the um, slit lamp to make sure there's no uh, fluid egressing. But the principle of, of suturing in the visual axis is the smallest sutures will be in the center. And as you march out to the periphery, you'll have um, even longer sutures. Uh, so how to treat a to total retinal detachment. Um, now I am not a retinal surgeon by any means. I'm a pediatric ophthalmologist uh, and as well as a corneal specialist. So my treatment is referring these patients. Um, but for my retinal colleagues, what they typically like to do for these types of patients, um, I think for a total RD in a child, uh, most likely is going to get a silicone oil fill, either 1,000 or 5,000 centistokes, and following them regularly. We know that total RD patients do have a high risk of complications, um, including tysis bulbi. So I think um, a silicone, so a, a full full vitrectomy um, followed by laser and then a silicone oil fill would probably be their approach. But uh, I'm really no retinal specialist, so. I'd have to defer that to a retinal specialist. How do you treat a child with corneal laceration traumatic cataract? So always want to close a corneal laceration first because the infusion pressure um, that you place in the eye to remove the cataract will allow the fluid to egress through the corneal laceration. So you either want to close the corneal laceration first and come back later for a stage traumatic cataract surgery, or you can close the, the corneal laceration at the beginning part of the surgery. And once it's watertight, you, as long as you have a view to the cataract, you have a good view to perform a safe cataract surgery, then you can proceed with the um, uh, traumatic cataract surgery removal. Um, how soon will deprivation, oh, sorry, this keeps changing. Um, how long does a normal pediatric optic nerve uh, tolerate high pressure after blunt trauma and moderate hyphema? I don't think there are any studies that show this. I would say more than about uh, IOP more than 40. I think you do have about a week or two before you will notice any type of um, significant change. Now, it does really depend on the cup to disc ratio. Now, you did mention a, a normal high pressure, more than 40. Um, some of my glaucoma colleagues say that if pressure is higher than 60, you have about a day or two to lower it. If the pressure is higher than 50, you have about two or three days. If the pressure is higher than 40, you have a little bit longer, about a week or two to lower the pressure. But that's just based off my conversations with my glaucoma colleagues. I don't really have any research or anything to support that, um, but I can definitely look into it. How do you manage traumatic subluxated lens with no cataract? 
that lens needs to come out, even if the lens itself is completely um, clear, no, sense of, no signs of cataract, if it's a little bit subluxated, so if the majority of the lens is still in the visual axis, you can treat with glasses. So I would treat it similar to, for example, a Marfan's patient or a patient that has homocysteinuria, where they have a traumatic, where they have a sublux lens, but it's still in the visual axis. If they're able to get good vision and good visual development with just uh, glasses, contact lenses, or some type of refractive error, um, then I would start it, start off with that. Now, if the traumatic subluxated lens is very far out of the visual field, then that lens needs to come out. There's no way to refixate the natural crystalline lens um, through surgery without causing the crystalline lens to form a cataract. So you would need to move the lens back into the visual axis, <coughs> um, um, an eye well back into the visual axis. There's no way to move the crystalline lens back. You could try, but it's going to form a cataract eventually. You would need to remove the crystalline, um, the crystalline lens that has subluxated. Now you could try to fixate the capsular bag if it's still intact to the sclera. Um, that would involve the use of a capsular tension ring as well as a capsular tension segment, which could be sutured to the uh, sclera using Gore-Tex suture and then placing the lens in the bag. But if it's extremely subluxated out of the visual access, that entire lens needs to come out. And you can work with your um, glaucoma colleagues to do a secondary lens placement, or this could be a good patient to get an artisan um, iris fixated lens. How much time um, do we have to follow a midriatic post-traumatic pupil? Um, that's a great question. I think the, the question really um, is associated with the coexisting comorbidities. If there's any signs of traumatic hyphema, if there's a microhythema, any circulating RBCs, then in the acute phase, this is pupil damage. So I would follow them daily for the first week, looking for any signs of IOP elevation. Um, if there is no associated hyphema and it's just an isolated midriatic post-traumatic pupil, I would follow it as I do a regular trauma. I would want to make sure that the patient, um, some of these uh, midriatic post-traumatic pupils in kids can improve over time. They can kind of decrease over time. Um, so you can kind of watch it uh, every few weeks, I would say, watch it maybe once a month for a few months. Now, eventually, this patient may need an iris uh, repair. Um, you can do that through uh, the four-tie pupil, uh, fourth row pupiloplasty technique. Um, you can also consider doing um, two sutures at, at both ends of the pupil. It just really depends on um, what type of midriatic post-traumatic pupil this patient has. Um, another, another option is uh, probably not for kids, but there is an artificial iris implant that can be plant implanted at the time of cataract surgery that can help with um, any type of photophobia as well. But what I would really be looking at is photophobia in these patients and how they are tolerating sunlight. Uh, if there are serrated corneal margins or a lost chunk of cornea, then how to close? That's an excellent question. I would get a, I've definitely seen this in patients. I would get a, a patch graft at that point whatever patch graft you have available in the operating room. It may be a scleral patch graft. It may be um, an irradiated cornea. It may be a fresh cornea. Whatever you can get, we need to close that chunk of pupil with, um, with some additional tissue. There's, there are certain cases where the tissue is tucked under um, or is in the anterior chamber or can be found, in which case um, you do want to primarily close the incision as best as you can. But I would get a patch graft, suture it in whatever size or shape you can. You just want that eye to be closed. Um, you don't want to have a risk of um, hypotony, tysis, and ophthalmitis. And then later, discuss with them that they will need a full corneal transplant. And regardless of what type of patch graft was used um, in the immediate period, you can take them back within a few days or a few weeks in order to do a full corneal transplant and um, ensure good long-term success. All right, so I think it's uh, the end of our time. I'd like to appreciate everyone that has stuck around for the end of this meeting, as well as the question and answer session. Um, I hope this was beneficial. And if there are additional topics that we'd like to discuss, please email me or we can do a, um, you know, a follow-up presentation as well. Thank you all.